These are the top five things I learned during the Learn You a Game Jam 2024 by Captain Coder. First off, thank you very much to Captain Coder for putting together a game jam. It is a lot of effort. Big thank you to him for putting this all together, and what a great time to uh, learn some new things. Now, what we're going to be looking at here today is my little entry Kiwi Quest. You can see I didn't get around to doing a whole lot of the art that I was hoping to do. No audio or visual effects. Uh, no tutorial, even, uh, which was a big bummer. Uh, nonetheless, learned quite a lot of things. This is what we're going to be talking about here today. You can see we have our little Kiwi doing his auto battler thing. He can only equip one item at a, at a time because he's a, just a little Kiwi. He's just got his little beak. And as we beat fights, we get access to more equipment uh, and uh, we charge our equipment as we hot swap it out using the keyboard keys. One, two, three, four, five, six so far. And we're able to fight against the bad guys doing their own thing. Once we get through three fights, congratulations, you win. That's it. So uh, it's it's a delightful little project. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, you know, had a, had a lot of fun with the pixel art and all that sort of stuff. But the things I want to talk about here, five things in particular that made this project uh, really big learning moments for me. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to gain a, gain a little bit from this as well. First off, planning. Planning really, really helps. I made this really big GDD at the very start of it, the game jam, trying to figure out what do I want to accomplish? What experience do I want the player to have? What genre is this? What is the theme? Who's the target audience? What are my inspiration games? I detailed out what is the core loop of this gameplay? What are the mechanics we're going to be putting in here? F made a flow for how is the logical progression of this game going to be uh art style audio ui all these things I, I even wrote out all of the different items what their effects were going to be what are the enemies and what are their effects and then started to map out from a data structure how is this going to work in godot how am i going to actually build this thing and then i built a roadmap for myself saying hey these are the things i all i need to all hit this was something that People were really nervous about when I was streaming it. They were really worried I was spending a lot of time planning. But you can see here, these first three days working on the project, I was getting so much done. All these check marks because I knew exactly what I was going to be working on that day. I knew how everything was going to fit together. And not everything stayed the same, especially this part here of structuring things. Um, I have a lot to learn as far as how to handle data structures better uh, from a programming uh you know, perspective. So this did not survive contact with the enemy, so to speak, but it gave me a starting off point that I could jump into really quick. And we made really good progress on our roadmap uh, all the way up until Thursday when there were some, uh, you know, sick kids and some other things that kind of interrupted life for me. And that threw me way off kilter. I had to kind of catch up as I could. But this plan really helped me get a whole lot of progress really fast can't recommend a good plan well enough next up groups groups in godot are awesome i have definitely been the sort of person that uses signal buses all over the place to uh this was my first time being introduced into groups you can see my groups right here groups are really cool you can assign a node into a group and that now is like a tag you can reference in your scripts so what I was doing here was with the toolbar, I added in all of these different nodes for the different items into this toolbar items group, and I made it a global group. What that meant I could do is whenever I needed to now, I could go make a little variable to store all this array of the nodes in that group. Now I can loop through that array and do whatever I need to do. So I didn't have to use signals in order to bounce between things, I didn't have to deal with, you know, adding signals to every single item. I could just put it in the group and then loop through it all and then say, hey, take this effect. And it was absolutely incredible. Really helped speed up quite a lot of things for me. Another thing, another thing that I learned in this is that good enough is good enough. You know, like, listen, none of this art is going to win first place. When I was talking about this, those of you who are more development 
uh, more software engineering inclined were probably saying, well, why do you have different nodes for all these? You should be generating those at runtime off of resources. And like, yeah, I mean, you're right. But I didn't have enough experience to know how to start with that right out of the gate and feel like I could make enough velocity. Like I've done stuff like that before, but I didn't have high confidence I could get it done within the timeline that I needed. And so I just went with the dumb option. And you know what? The dumb option worked. This isn't something I'd want to build an entire game off of, but to get a prototype up and running, absolutely. Worked like a charm. There's stuff like that all over the place. Like the UI not being in its own UI layer, it's being attached to like the player or to the enemies and all sorts of things that could totally be refactored and reworked. But by avoiding that temptation to realize, oh, you know, I need to redo this. Oh, you know, I need to redo that to make it better, more extensible, more modular. I got a lot done. Like a lot done. So that's something that I'm definitely taking forward. Reusable components are the absolute bomb. This is number three. Instead of hand coding each and every attack, for example, all these different pieces of equipment, I instead did the smart thing, which is uh, creating these reusable functions. So for example, damaging the player is like a function that exists on the player, not tied to any item, if I want to make the sword, all I have to do is say, uh, activate this sword signal. If we go here, sword activate dot connect. Here we go. Now, I just send out a damage enemy signal with the right stats from the sword resource. And then all of a sudden, it goes through. So if I want to make another attack, I don't have to hand code anything. I just send out another signal saying damage enemy dot emit. Easy, easy peasy. There's stuff like that all over the place in here to make all these items work. Uh, it was absolutely tremendous. Having the effects divorced from the items, really good thing. I'm gonna be carrying that forward a bunch. And then the last thing I learned, uh, was my stated goal for this game jam was I wanted to practice emergent gameplay. And that kind of happened, but really what I learned this time around was ways to help the player feel clever, which was a really good little surprise for me. For example, you can see this guy is charging up his stick attack. I can throw up a physical shield. I'm gonna block that, that feels good. Now he's throwing up his shield. So if I blast through that shield with a physical attack, it's just gonna nullify it. But if I wait for him to get another shield up, he's physically shielded. I had a combo attack that is gonna do extra magic damage because my sword was charged up enough that circumvented his physical shield and did extra damage to him. So now I feel very clever, right? Now going into this fight with the will of the wisp, oh, I'm gonna be on the lookout for more of those shields. I'm gonna say, oh, you're throwing up a physical shield. Let's throw out a wand attack, do extra double damage. Let's start throwing the sword out while you're charging your magic shield, right? All of these things to kind of get the player in this mode of trying to take advantage of the enemy's weaknesses and openings uh, felt incredibly clever. I, I really liked that. And uh, you know, uh, another good example here is the, the boots and the hammer. Like we have the dragon who has a ton of health. You have to utilize everything in your toolbox. Well, if you try and just beat him down, he's gonna win. He's going to smash through you really hard. He's gonna throw up abilities like reflect that, uh, like this one, that will just completely reflect all damage from one attack back to the player. But if you use your hammer, you can get him out of that. You remove that ability, and now he's invulnerable, so while he's invulnerable, I'm gonna charge up my attacks, so that when he gets out of invulnerable, I can do just this big mega hit. Like, it just, it's great. It feels really good. Feel very clever whenever you pull something like that out. Ah, oh, in particular, that stunning route uh, was quite interesting because it was just kind of one way to circumnavigate that reflect barrier uh, big scary thing that was coming down the line. For example, I could have uh, uh, just tried to throw in the hammer, but it takes too long to charge. He's going to get it out before I'm even able to uh, get my attack out. So I can either try and, you know, spinning plate, keep the spinning plate going. I can keep this 
loaded up, but not quite there until it's ready. And you can see it's gonna slowly decrement over time, so we can't we can't do that forever. But uh, so that's one thing I could do. I could try and do the spinning plates. I could try and uh, get my haste boots up and ready so that I can really quickly charge through the hammer stun item. Uh, and then as well, maybe I just plan ahead. Maybe I'm just being really good at being aware. Okay, this guy's going to throw out the magic shield next. So I got to make sure that I'm going to charge up my things appropriately, right? So there's different routes people can take to get to that stunning action. And whatever route that the player takes, they're going to learn from it and they're going to feel very clever. It was uh, a big success in that regard. So, Captain Coder, those are the big things that I learned. I, if you have any thoughts, uh, any of you watching this, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of thoughts on how to structure this code better. But if you have any thoughts about what we learned, anything you want to talk about, uh, we had a lot of discussion in the stream about, you know, signals and, and their proper, you know, time to come in and be used versus global variables versus groups. All of these things, I'm more than happy to help out and share my experience with you. Uh, we stream every weekday. Uh, where we do game development, game analysis. Uh, we're hosting a game jam on July 6th. That's just in a few days. And we have all sorts of prizes, including a raffle with eight entries of 50 bucks if you just submit a project. If all you do is just build something and submit it, you're automatically going to be entered for one of those raffles. So uh, come on by. We are very friendly to new people. Our entire purpose at Fox Hollow Games is to help people enter the game industry. We're a charitable organization. So if you feel that you could use some of that support, come on over, like, follow, subscribe, and we will catch you next time.